Him, Tarzan. Him, animator. You, watch. Before we start, don't forget to check out our Discord, our coffee page, and like, subscribe, comment, hit the bell, all the things. It really helps us out. Since this is our fourth and final episode on Glenn Keane's career, might I suggest you watch the other three before we continue? It's really just the best way to experience like the Glenn Keane discography cinematic universe. It's probably a good idea, honestly. But for those who are lazy, or have watched and forgotten, here is a 29-word summary, which leaves out a bit for time's sake. Start the clock! Born in 1954, son of Bill Keane of Family Circus fame, attended CalArts, first animation job Filmation, followed by Elliot the Bear, Wild Things, Radigan, Chipmunks, Ariel, Beast, Aladdin. Are we all caught up? Good. This episode will start in 1993-ish, when Glenn was cast as the title character of Pocahontas. No! Not that way! Show off. Following the demands of Jeffrey Katzenberg to make Pocahontas the most idealized and finest woman ever made, Keane first sought his inspirations for his depictions of Pocahontas from Shirley Little Dove Custolo McGowan and Debbie White Dove, women he had met during the research trip to Virginia. Keane recalled meeting the women. So I turned around and there's this beautiful Indian woman walking up, a Native American. She said, are you Glenn Keane, the animator that's going to do Pocahontas? I said, well, yeah. And then from behind another tree, another woman came up and she said, well, my name is Shirley Little Dove, and this is my sister, Debbie White Dove, and we are descended from Pocahontas. And as they stood there, I mean, I took a picture of both of them, and between their faces was Pocahontas's face in my mind. I could see her. Okay, I've been noticing Native American faces uh, and Asian faces, and I'm trying to understand the simplicity of that face because it's, it's very not Freddie Moore or Little Mermaid, which was kind of the Disney style. So I, I drew for Nick. I said, well, this is basically the design right here. And I drew Superman's shield and drew the S on it right on the paper that I just was working with Aladdin, which was pretty stupid. I should have put another sheet down, but I drew it on that one. And I said, so I, it's going to be like this. And, and so I started to turn he left the office, um, I'm sure, thinking, hmm, okay, well, it's going to look like Superman's shield. But then I started to draw her in there, and um, and she just took over the drawing. And Aladdin was, like, disappearing. And now it was all about Pocahontas. And uh, then I had this dilemma, like, oh, do I erase this Pocahontas or well, I, went, I made a copy of it and um, yeah, I think I did end up erasing that, but I had a copy of it so that I, I could design her continue after that. So there is this place, there's this time um, of searching for the reality of what you're looking for in a design of a character, say, for example, um, and that you may have come up with 600 versions of it. Um, and other people are coming in, looking at it and going, uh, so what's wrong with that one? Like, you know, I don't know. It's a nice drawing. It's like, yeah, that's, that's going to be really good. It's like, no, no, that, that can't be her or that can't be the beast. And, um, and that's how it, that's how it went for me. And then, Finally, the character as you're drawing suddenly appears out of the page and you recognize them. It's this weird thing that they seem to exist before you draw them.
No, wait, wait. Please. Please. Don't run off. Glenn Keane was at the top of his game and to no one's surprise was cast as yet another title character in Disney's lineup, the one and only Tarzan. On this film, the animators were split into two teams. Glenn was the supervising animator for Tarzan at the Paris studio, while Ken Duncan was the supervising animator for Jane at the studio in Burbank. Glenn's main challenge was combining Tarzan's animal side with his human anatomy, but not in a scary sci-fi way more like a cool, non-scary way. <laughs> we went to Africa, we studied how animals move, we studied sculptures, uh, anatomy. One of the things I loved about working in Paris was the chance to ride my bike and discover things along the way, like this statue by Dalou in the Place de la Nation. There's a man riding this lion, and when I went around this statue, I thought, that's Tarzan. So we started to do drawings based on what we saw from that sculpture and other studies of anatomy. We brought in the professor of anatomy from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. Uh, I did these drawings in pencil. He went over the muscles in red. We found that this costume that Tarzan was wearing was going to be the most complicated of all. It was the first time we'd ever animated actually a functioning human anatomy. See, the very first test, these don't really look like Tarzan as much because this was our first attempt, but they were experimenting with how Tarzan would move as an animal. One, it's an animation here. This is not exactly on model Tarzan. It was his first attempt, but there was something nice about the way he clears his hair out of his eyes, I felt. In this scene, he was studying how basketball players hang on the hoop, and it was just a real fun uh, fluidity and natural rhythm to this movement. At the same time, with the animal feel that he's comfortable on all fours, and it, it just had this great freshness and spontaneity to his movement. It was important that Tarzan be able to move on all fours in a convincing way, and in a way that didn't make him feel like the family dog, that there was a, a spring to his step. The way he can climb up and use his feet for climbing had to be natural. Uh, here, Terry has got Tarzan moving through the, the vines with baboons. The poses are like monkeys moving through the trees. We were discovering just how far you could go with Tarzan and still have him be believable. There's an energy that you get when you do your first rough animation. These are the very first rough tests of Tarzan sliding down this little roller coaster of a jungle with Jane in his arms. I had noticed that in front of Notre Dame, the way the, uh, the rollerbladers would go between these Coke cans, they had this fun little movement with his, with his feet. And I thought, why not have Tarzan to be able to do this? So we actually built the branches so that Tarzan's feet could be going back and forth as if they're going through the Coke cans and it, uh, I think it worked great. The animal movements that Tarzan has are, are fun to watch, but we really relate to Tarzan because of the human emotions he shows. Here's a sequence where you see Tarzan in the treehouse where he discovers his roots. Is this me? These scenes, for me, are often the most difficult because you are trying to express such emotions that you feel your, yourself and you've experienced in your own life. I remember animating these scenes feeling the same emotions Tarzan was going through. And all you can do sometimes is just press harder on your pencil to try to, to make the drawing express what you're feeling in your heart. And you hope that the audience can feel it as they're looking at it. The scene where Tarzan meets Jane face to face is a moment where he discovers someone like him. You have to express it in the eyes, and I tried to find a moment in my own life when I had seen and discovered somebody like myself for the first time. And I remember my daughter Claire being born, 30 seconds old. The doctor puts her in my hand, and I looked, and it was like a mirror. I could see myself. And I told Claire, when you see this scene, Claire, that's not Tarzan looking at Jane. That's me looking at you. 
These are the things that make Disney animation real for us, is taking our own life and trying to put that up onto the screen so the audience feels it like we did. Moving on to one of the most underrated films in Disney's library, Treasure Planet. There being no title character this time, Glenn chose instead to take on John Silver. When asked if he drew inspiration from the previous film adaptations of Treasure Island for the character designs, Glenn Keane said he disliked looking at previous portrayals of a character to clear his mind of stereotypes, but that he drew some inspiration for how Silver spoke from actor Wallace Beery, whom he loved because of the way he talked out of the side of his mouth. Well, Jim, I guess you'll have to stand on deck and watch me swing. I can't bear the thought of it, of you, or of anybody. Oh, we won't think about that, Jim. You just dies, and that's that. No, you listen to me, James Hawkins. You got the makings of greatness in you, but you gotta take the helm and charge your own course. Stick to it. No matter the squalls. And when the time comes, you get the chance to really test the cut of your sails and show what you're made of. Well, I hope I'm there, catching some of the light coming off you that day. Around the same time as working on Treasure Planet, Glenn began on a new project, which he planned on directing. I started this movie in 96, actually starting to work on it, uh, when I was working on Tarzan, and, uh, and continued to develop it while doing other movies. But in 2008, I had a heart attack, and I decided I was just going to step back and give myself some time, give it to uh, Byron and Nathan to go ahead and direct. And uh, I took six months off and came back and then worked closely with them uh, overseeing the animators. I love characters that have this burning desire inside, this, this sense of believing the impossible is possible. I, I, I look for characters that have got that. And even why I wanted to do this movie from the very beginning, uh, there was something about this character that has so much potential inside of her. Uh, who's born from this magical flower, has a gift that she has to share with the world, but is being kept back and held back. It's as if she's like a nuclear reactor. The, the more you hold her back, she's got to get out. Even her hair is a symbol of, of potential that has to be released. And I felt like this is a character that the world really needs to see right now. What's fun with uh, Rapunzel, the character, I mean, that she, she truly is naive and innocent uh, and knows nothing about the outside world. And this, then so Flynn, who is a guy who just, who's lived life to the full, they're the perfect combination. And you just keep playing on that. The situations that, where she should be afraid, uh, you did, she, you let her be afraid, but then you let her overcome it with how she uses her hair is suddenly like a whip or, or you know, she, she can swing through the air with it. She's a little bit of Tarzan, uh, but she's, uh, she's fearless. On shots where you don't see the hair, it's only like down to her ankles or the lower part of her back sometimes. But on those long shots, it was actually 70 feet of it and we had to animate it uh, well, there's 140,000 hairs. Uh, we had 47 different tubes that the animators could animate. Um, hair is the most difficult thing a computer can possibly do. Uh, and we started writing software on this movie uh, in 2002, started bringing um, incredibly creative artists uh, who, who are artists in mathematics, figuring this out. I, I've really gained an enormous respect of, I used to think that all our artists were people that drew, and now I realize, no, 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 you can, you can be a mathematical artist as well. After Rapunzel, Glenn retired from Disney. He decided to work on the evolution of animation and explore all the ways it could expand. 
He worked on Duet, Neftali, Dear Basketball, and Over the Moon, a beautifully animated film which you can find on Netflix. Netflix, the world's number one streaming service. With shows like Squid Game and Stranger Things, you can't go wrong. Please sponsor us. In Over the Moon, Feifei, having her be with her parents by the water at the beginning of the movie and it's this family together and um, I'm, I'm just, I keep drawing them and trying to create the truth of a family together. Um, and it, I, I must have done a thousand drawings of them. But I was noticing the way Olive, my granddaughter, would, would sit and she just has this ability to fold her knees. Her knees go and her feet go back and she's just flat on the ground. And I was just like, that is so cool. And I got, I got to, I've got to do that with Fei Fei and, and just drawing that suddenly it was like a little fire that just spread over every, it was truth. And it was truth in seemingly unimportant area of the way a little girl's hips and knees have that flexibility. And, but it spread everywhere in the drawing and affected the, the dad sitting there and the mom. And, and I've, I've seen this again and again and again. It's, it's a little tilt of a wrist that feels fake. And then suddenly you turn it just a little bit and the angels sing. And, and then it kind of just goes over the rest of the character. So one of the things that was really incredibly helpful for me on Over the Moon was um, I had a conversation with Sasha Kapichimpanga, our head of the animation department up at Sony. Um, and I'm thinking, how can I get control over so many animators to bring a consistent vision of who that is to everybody? Because um, I wasn't going to be animating. So I'm going to rely on them. But if we had a, like in Little Mermaid, I had um, Sherry Stoner come in and we filmed her as an actress that I could have other animators use as reference. And I said, Sasha, I think we, sh we should really have a actress come in for our reference and we can film her acting these moments. So there's a common uh, ground for everybody. And it's not an inconsistency with Fei Fei. And he said, um, and Sasha's just the best person to work with. He's so heartfelt himself and sensitive and uh, flexible and humble. But he resisted the, <laughs> the temptation to say, sure, yeah, okay, Glenn. Instead, he said, Glenn, I really think we should not do what you are suggesting. I really think that we should have the, each animator film themselves playing that moment um, because the only way I think you can get this kind of performance you're looking for is for them to feel it. And they're going to do something that comes from inside them and that's what's going to be up on the screen. Uh, and I just thought, gosh, he just addressed everything that Ollie was saying, you know, that. It's got to come from the inside. You, how else can you know what a character is feeling if you don't feel it yourself? As you can see, special attention was given to all the costumes in this film, which was not Glenn's forte. I know nothing about sewing. I know nothing about fabrics. I find shopping with Linda the most boring thing in the world. The best thing is I got my sketchbook and I can draw everybody there and I know I've got an inordinate amount of time of sitting there while she's shopping. So that's good. But costume design, Guo Pei is this unbelievable Chinese costume designer that um, it was suggested maybe she would be good to work with her in designing Chang'e's costumes. And she had a it just happened that across the street from Sony at the Vancouver Art Museum, they had this big exhibit, Guo Pei, and her, all of her dresses and everything are there. 
And I don't know if you're familiar with any of her work, but it is just crazy, amazing fabric and design and shapes. And it was, it'd be as if Kandinsky uh, was a costume designer or something. Um, and so I met her. She didn't speak a word of English. I didn't speak a word of Chinese. Um, but her husband spoke English. And so, you know, we were very polite and we were talking. And, and I noticed that uh, Guo Pei would, would talk like really fast, just talking, 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 talking. Her hands are gesturing. And her husband said, well, she says she really loves animation. It's like, that's, I know that's not what she, I know there's more <laughs> than that. Uh, it's because she was so expressive. And finally, at about halfway through, um, uh, her husband got up to leave to go whatever, have lunch or something. So we spent the next hour just talking English and Chinese together. But really, we didn't do that. It was drawing. We both drew together and uh, with some watercolors and the paper was never big enough for her. So I added more paper and we sketched together and her hand movement. And it was the most wonderful thing, like knowing inside how important this was going to be for the film, willing every learning neuron in my being to open up, open up listen, watch, learn. I have no idea what she's saying, but I am never going to forget the gestures of her hands and talking about silk. And, and I knew how far she searched worldwide, for the best silk and knowing that in CG, we could, we could invent physics and create super silk. And, um, and I had gotten that at point across through her husband. But so, I remembered how her hands were, were moving and um, when it came time to animate in the Chamber of Exquisite Sadness and we're animating Chang'e's silk floating, um, it was her hands um, that were in my head um, and drawing over the animation. So they felt like those patterns of her movement. And um, I love just leaning into something entirely new and working with her, oh, there's such joy in that. Working for Netflix for me on Over the Moon was interesting because they really did give me <clears throat> enormous freedom. And um, and I kept getting this one note uh, and it was like, I don't need to do that. I, I know, we just, I just didn't believe in it. And then finally <laughs> it was, we were down to like the, we had five minutes left before we had to send out this version and that was gonna be it um, storyboard wise. And, and most of the film was animated and uh, Jenny Rim, our producer is, is in there and John Cars is sitting next to me and I'm looking at this moment in the film and suddenly I realized they're right, they're right. We've got five minutes and we, <laughs> I said, okay, this, we need to do this. And suddenly I'm sketching as fast as I can look over John Carr's is drawing. And we, we turned and we both had the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Hadn't talked about it, but John's was this perfect um, bird's eye view diagram with cameras showing the angles of all the shots. Uh -huh. Those little scribbly rough sketches of the, the character moments in there. We cut it together and that's the way it is in the movie. Um, and it, I think I, waiting for that right moment was really good. Mm -hmm. I think it, sometimes as a director, you say no, and you're not saying no because you don't, you, you don't respect them. It's because you're not ready for it. Fly away, Chang, are you calling to me? Fly away. Are you up there looking at me? Can you see what nobody sees? Can you hear my voice up on the moon? Fly away. 
Wish I had the wings to take me high away To a place where no one doubts me And I'd walk on a lunar dune Could I find a way to get there soon? Build a rocket to the moon Glenn Keane is so fascinating to listen to. His emotion when he talks about his art mimics the struggle he has with getting what he wants onto paper. Glenn draws with his emotions, which is both beautiful and spectacular. So, to sum up our Glenn Keane Disography Cinematic Universe, he is pretty cool. Thank you to these people for supporting us on Patreon and Coffee. And if you want to make sure this channel sticks around, you can check out our Coffee link in the description. Every bit helps. Thank you for watching this episode of Disographies. Click the thumbs up button below if you liked it. And if you want to be notified when the next episode comes out, consider subscribing and hitting the bell. Comment below with characters you would like to see us cover. Further reading and references are linked below. We hope to see you in another discography.